Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for this dialogue. My name is Claire McFarlane and I want to begin today by acknowledging that we are meeting on Indigenous land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been Indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of this place. In particular, the museum acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The museum is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the six nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Thank you. Um, so as well, before we begin to this, uh, tonight's event, I would like to say that this event is in support of our exhibition here at the museum in Kitchener um, called Alarm. So this past year, the museum has been weighing in on the climate crisis uh, with the Alarm exhibition, which is open from now until January 2021. Alarm includes two exhibitions, Agents for Change, Facing the Anthropocene, and Melting Ice. Now this evening's event is in partnership with the Royal Canadian Institute for Science. And in just a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Kirsten Vanstone, who is the Executive Director of RCI Science and will be moderating this evening's event. Um, so before I hand it over to her, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Kirsten, Carrie, and RCI Science, as well as Ed, who you'll be meeting in just a moment for helping to put this event together. So I'll now pass it over to Kirsten. Thank you very much, Claire. So uh, RCI Science is really pleased to partner with the museum. We love museums and it's a really exciting thing for us to do. The exhibit sounds fantastic. I can't wait till I can come out and see it in person. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, just because we are not sitting in a room together does not mean that you cannot interact with us. Please use the comments section in YouTube or on Facebook to uh, ask questions or make comments and we will be reading those throughout the event. If you don't wish to use that, you can also send questions and comments via email to information at rciscience.ca or you can tweet them to at RCI Science or at the museum. Um, so what is RCI Science? So Claire did mention we are the Royal Canadian Institute. It's one of a handful of organizations that is actually older than Canada. So we've been around since 1849. We were originally a small club that worked out of Toronto and that club grew and it changed, but its main focus was, was and still is to bring people together to talk about science and innovation, things that our founders believe could help Canada. So you can find out more about us at rciscience.ca where you can check out things like our blog, our holiday gift guide, which has got a science twist and uh, get the latest information on upcoming events. You can also find us on Twitter at RCI Science and same on Facebook. Uh, we are a member-based organization, so if you have a look on the website, you can find it a little bit more about that. We would love to get some members from this event and uh, we have a lot of really great things that we can um, plan, we are planning for the future. And tonight is one of, a, a new thing, new partnership, but also a new initiative that we did at the beginning of the lockdown, the beginning of the pandemic, which was a book club. A lot of book clubs coming up, none of them about science books. So we thought, why don't we do a science book club? And we thought it was a great way to connect people and to enjoy some of the fantastic science writing out there. And tonight's speaker is one of Canada's own fantastic science writers. He is also an educator, public speaker, and fellow at the Institute for Energy and Environmental Policy at the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University in Kingston. Ed Strusick is that speaker, and his work has received many honors, including one from us. He actually received the Royal Canadian Institute uh, Fleming Medal for Science Communication. It's an award we give every year, and I'll tell you about another one coming up in a little bit. Uh, we were recognizing his work in translating science of all kinds, but particularly that connected with the environment. And the book that tonight's event is built around, Firestorm, also won an award. It won the Science Writers and Communicators of Canada's 2018 Science and Society Book Award. And having read it, it's easy to see why. The book is full of connections to policy and government. And it has, if I can say, some a little bit alarming parallels to the situation we now find ourselves in with the pandemic. But I'd like to get back to Ed. He has many articles and essays that appear in journals, magazines, and newspapers, such as Scientific American, National Geographic, the Los Angeles Times, The Conversation, Canadian Geographic, The Globe and Mail, The National Post. I'm just going to stop because there's so many. 
Uh, and he has written six books and has told us that he has two more coming out in the next 12 months or so. So he says he's a little bleary eyed with all these deadlines. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Ed Strusick to talk about living with fire in the age of climate change. Great, thank you very much, very generous. Um, what I'm gonna present here is a bit of a hybrid uh, uh, of my last book and my next book on fire. And what that is, is, uh, is what the past uh, history of fire tells us about what's happening right now and what's going to be happening in the future. Very speculative, but I think that uh, we're seeing signs of it happening al already. Uh, so let's start off. Before Europeans arrived on the scene, um, what was the fire situation like? Well, we know from charcoal layers and sediments and methane concentrations and ice cores uh, that a certain amount of global warming fluctuated dramatically over time and that uh, the charcoal records derived from lake sediments and peats at hundreds of sites around the world show a distinct lull in burning from around 1600 to 1750. And that lull in fire occurred during the Little Ice Age, 1500 to 1850, when temperatures in North America, Britain, Scandinavia, dropped by about one to, to two degrees Celsius. Uh, we also know that lightning strikes accounted for an unknown but significant number of those fires before the uh, 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 arrival of Europeans, and presumably many of them loom large because we just didn't have the resources uh, there to suppress them. Humans were also part of the fire equation. Indigenous people we know routinely lit fires to clear the land in order to attract game and to nurture the growth of berries and root vegetables. Uh, the Europeans just did not understand this. John Sullivan of the Palliser expedition through Canada in 1860 reflected the views of many when he said, it is most lamentable to see so often such masses of valuable timber destroyed almost invariably by wanton carelessness and mischief. Unfortunately, the Indians have a most disastrous habit of setting the prairie on fire for the most trivial and worse than usual reasons. Now, Henry David Thoreau um, had a kind of a connection with them because he accidentally set fire to the forest uh, near his cabin uh, in, Ma in Massachusetts. Uh, but when he saw things greening up uh, shortly afterwards, he realized maybe fire's not that all bad. That I've set fire to the forest, but I have done no wrong therein, and now it is as if the lightning had done it. These flames are consuming their natural food. Thoreau, of course, was ahead of his time. Uh, people really did not understand fire. Uh, they didn't have a lot of it at the landscape, uh, unless it was accidental uh, from fires like the one uh, Thoreau started. But then a new reality begins to unfold as that little ice age starts sputtering and coming to an end. Higher temperatures and more lightning set the stage for big fires in forested landscapes that were rapidly filling up with people. And big fires such as Miramichi, which burned in Maine and New Brunswick in 1885, 1825 was inevitable. That was a big fire. You know, Fort McMurray, which we think is, what, is a huge fire at 1.5 million acres, Miramichi was more than three times that size. Uh, and think about it, no one at the time knew how to deal with a fire as big as Miramichi because they never experienced anything like it coming from Britain and coming to a cold, rainy part of North America. Uh, one of the re records of the time said those fortunate enough to be near a river took refuge in the water, often trying to coax their cows and pigs with them. The livestock were panicked by the smoke and the flames and refused to enter. Most of them succumbed to the heat and the smoke. Wild animals had no such fear and the humans in the river found that soon found, found themselves surrounded uh, by raccoons, deers, bears, and even large moose. And as things got warmer, big fires followed with, in, with increasing frequency. There was a huge fire in the Saguenay and the Ottawa Valleys in 1870. The Peshtigo Fire of 1871 killed more than 2,000 people in northern Wisconsin. Hinkley Fire of 1894 in northern Minnesota killed 418 people. The Great Fire of, of 1908 in Fernie didn't kill a lot of people, but it burned 90% of the town. And it was the second time in five years that town burn. The Porcupine Wildfire of 1911 killed 200 people, burned half a million acres. 
uh, a newspaper report said the fire sucked the oxygen out of the atmosphere with such force that mature trees were ripped from the ground. People who took refuge in the mine shafts were asphyxiated. Others drowned when a boxcar of dynamite exploded by the shores of Porcupine Lake. The wealthy owner of one of the mines in the region died trying to save his cat. Then there was a Nath Nath Matheson fire that, that happened five years later in the very same place of Northern Ontario. Officially 230, 20, 23 people were killed. The number was probably a lot higher. But the fire that really set the course for the future of fire, wildfire management was the Great Fire of 1910. And there were 1,736 small fires smoldering in Northern Idaho and Western Montana. And I should add in uh, Southern Alberta and Southeastern British Columbia. And then hurricane force winds blew in late that summer. Three million acres burned in just three days. 86, 86 people died and a lot more would have had the military not come in and had the trains not come in to take people out. Uh, a fire ranger said this about the fire, again, you know, reflecting the fact that they just didn't really understand phenomena like this. The roar from these fires was heard for miles and was likened by some of the rangers in their path to the noise of a thousand freight trains crossing simultaneously as many steel trestles. At many points, these fires jumped rivers a quarter or a half mile wide, and in several instances, leaped across canyons a mile or more in width, from ridge to ridge, leaving solid strips of green timber untouched. People around this time started seeing the trend, and one of them was California timber harvester George Hoxie, who said in 1910, the year of that fire, we had best dot fire as our servant, otherwise it will be our master. And he suggested that we do what the indigenous people did, light small fires to reduce the amount of fuel that could burn in the forest, do what, and do what mother nature did. The state engineer of California was in favor of it. A lot of timber owners were in favor of it naturally and the Southern Pacific Railroad was in favor of it. The problem is, is that this was unacceptable. Uh, politics came into play. Henry Graves, the US forest chief from 1910 to 1920 declared the fire, forest fire protection is the first measure necessary for the successful practice of forestry and that the doctrine of light burning is nothing less than the advocacy of forest destruction and those who preach the doctrine have a large share of responsibility for fires which their influences cause. And his successor William Greeley vowed a fire like 1910 would never happen again he declared wildfire menaced, prescribed burning was evil, and fire prevention is the number one job of American foresters. And this was reflected in the view of many Canadians, such as Bernard Furnow, who was the US forest chief one time and became the Dean of the Faculty of Forests at the University of Toronto. He saw fire as the worst enemy and forests as crops that needed to be harvested, not burned. Conflagrations are due largely to bad habits and loose morals, he said in a kind of religious way. So what did we do? First thing we did was kick indigenous people out of national parks such as Yellowstone and Yosemite, as well as Banff and Jasper, Riding Mountain National Park, Wood Buffalo National Park, and a more organized institutional forest fire strategy was put into place. Ferdinand Silcox, the US Forest Service Chief, came up with a quick action strategy. Every fire was to be controlled by 10 a.m. of the day following discovery. And it was a strategy that it was adopted by Canada. Fire lookouts were built to detect fires. Some were crude, not particularly stable like this one. Imagine trying to uh, climb up that in a windstorm. Uh, others were more elaborate. Heliographs were used by rangers to send fire messages by means of a mirror in the sun's rays. Not very scientific, but it worked. Tree phones were used to communicate the location of fire later on, and a wildfire control, control centers dispatch firefighters by foot, by horse, by truck, by boat, by rail car, on hand levered pump trolleys, by train. The Can Canadian Mounties even set up their own fire crews, and so did Parks Canada. In the U.S., a Civilian Conservation Corps was established by Roosevelt during the Depression years, um, put men to work to fight fires. Between 1933 and 1942, 6.5 million days were spent fighting forest fires in the United States, mostly along the Canadian border. 
Here in Canada, the Royal Canadian Air Force pilots were deployed to find fires. Once a fire was spotted from the air, the guy there in the back seat of the plane would uh, toss out a roll of toilet paper and the people on the ground could see where the fire was and which direction to go. I'm not sure it always worked. Uh, and starting 1939, smoke jumpers were deployed to fight fires in the US. We even used homing pigeons, beavers. Some people in Wisconsin got the idea that maybe we could uh, fly beavers out uh, into the back country where they would build dams and wetlands that would stop fires. And every, but there were no roads going into those wetlands, into those remote areas. So they came up with the idea of parachuting them in in wooden crates and then dropping them down, assuming that the crates would break open and the beavers would survive and walk out. And if they didn't break open, that they would eventually just chew their way out. They transported a lot of beavers, including uh, Geronimo, who was the test beaver, uh, an old guy that uh, did a number, did number of test flights. Civilians on both sides of the border were encouraged to participate. Smokey the Bear, as everybody know, became the North American symbol of the effort to promote forest fire prevention. Advertising was used to demonize fire. During the war, fire was seen as a, the secret weapon of, uh, of the enemy because it would take up so much person power to put those fires out. Bar Harbor burned in 1947. It was a resort uh, town. Uh, it got totally out of control and uh, they brought in the Canadians to help. And that set up basically an international fire cooperation program that lasted this day. And then science added sophistication to fire suppression st strategies. Uh, the US and Canada started setting up research labs across the country to see how fire behaved and how we might be able to put them out. The results, very successful. Between 1920 and 1950, 10 to 50 million acres burned annually in the US. By the 1950s, annual burnt area was as low as 1.9 million acres. And it's a similar situation here in Canada. We managed to virtually remove fire from the landscape. Uh, people started realizing that there are a lot of old trees there and they were getting very, very thick. And uh, maybe uh, we were getting away from what mother nature and indigenous people did in the past. And so Yellowstone was a bit of a turning point. Uh, park officials attempted to stop this demonization of fire and they allowed some lightning triggered fires in the back country of Yellowstone to burn. Uh, it was a great idea, but the timing was really unfortunate. Um, the 200 fire, four, 240 fires that burned that summer put fear in the hearts of decision makers and a public that had all but forgotten or never heard of the great fire. It was one of the hottest, driest seasons on record. Uh, everybody got in. President Rod Ronald Reagan dismissed this relatively net let burn policy in Yellowstone as cockamamie. Um, time proved them to be wrong, however, but it took a lot of time. Grizzly bears and black bears immediately moved into the burn areas to feed on carrion. Fire beetles moved in to lay their eggs on warm stumps. Nighthawks and woodpe woodpeckers fed on the beetles. Owls nested in snags, feeding their chickens rodents that were more exposed in fire-scarred areas. Aspen shoots shot up even as the fires smoldered, and elk and bison moved in to feed on those fresh young aspen shoots. And the coniferous trees followed. And grizzly bears fattened up on the roots and berries that thrived in burned out areas where the sun was able to shine through to the ground. They got fat bears. This was really interesting. No one could really understand why bears in the national parks where fire suppression was a big thing tended to be a lot thinner than bears outside of the national parks where there was clear cut logging and fire was uh, taking its course. And then they realized that what was really going on was that those dense forests in places like Jasper and Banffer were shading out all the very be ber berries and root vegetables that the bears uh, relied on. 30 years later, it's hard to detect evidence of that fire in Yellowstone. And we could have continued on, on, on with that lesson, except that a new reality comes into play and that's climate change. And with warmer temperatures, just one degree, you get 12% increase in lightning strikes. You also have extended droughts, uh, more in disease and insects move in. And you could see this happening in British Columbia 
and also places like Jasper where mountain pine beetle was not really a problem until really fairly recently. I participated in an aerial survey of uh, mountain beetles in Jasper in 2010, and I think over a two or three day period, we counted 400 trees in the park that were killed by pine, mountain pine beetles. By 2020, think about 10 years later, Jasper National Park uh, stopped counting the number of dead trees. They measured the infestation in acres. In 2020, more than 62,000 acres of the National Park's forest were infected by the pine beetle. That's a lot of fuel on the ground. Higher temperatures, more lightning, drought, disease and pests, as well as an increasing number of people in forested landscapes really began testing the limits of firefighting resources. And I got a chance to see some insights. This is a great uh, thing that I learned from uh, Rob Walker, who was Parks Canada Fire uh, and Vegetation Specialist in 2003. And I, I, I was allowed to have a look at uh, how they were dealing with fire in Kootenai National Park. And he said at the time that that fire season was the harbinger of future fires on the landscape, really what climate change was going to bring in the future. Uh, that summer, 25 fires burned 13% of Glacier National Park. 2,000 people were forced out of Crow's Nest Pass for most of the summer. 1,000 people evacuated during the 30 Miles Fire in Oregon. Jasper National Park burned, nearly burned big uh, as a result of a prescribed burn that got out of control, uh, as did Banff. Kootenai, like I said earlier, uh, two of the three mountain highways connecting east to west that summer were closed for periods of time. And then later on in the fall, 40,000, 5,000 people were evacuated in British Columbia because of the fires around Kelowna and Kamloops. And then the Cedar Fire in California. This was really one of the very first big wildfires in California. Before that, California really did not have a wildfire problem. That fire spread at a rate of 3,600 acres per hour, destroying 20, 2,820 buildings and killing 15 people. People thought that was a big deal back then. Even polar bear country burned that summer. Uh, I know this uh, because uh, Mark Hethcock from Parks Canada was telling me that while he was in over his head trying to uh, um, uh, deal with the fires that were happening in national parks down south, he got a call from uh, uh, the Prince of Wales uh, historic site in on the west coast of Hudson Bay saying that they needed help because the uh, one of the historic buildings might be burned down by a fire. They saved it, but a lot of polar bear den sites were destroyed. This is where polar bears den in the boreal forest. Um, and I know because one of the things that I've always wanted to do was go inside a polar bear den. And of course, there's the, you know, the hero shot. Uh, I got out and as I was looking through uh, at the camera while I was back in the helicopter, the pilot uh, was poking me uh, and I looked up and he pointed to a uh, uh, female polar bear and a cub who were behind the den uh, looking at us. We'd assumed that they'd left and they'd gone back to Western Hudson Bay. So I don't think I'm ever going to do that again. So resources were so strained in 2003 that military personnel and firefighters from all over the world were brought in to help. It wasn't enough. Triage, triage became the order of the day. And since then, destructive fires have been more, burning more often and most importantly, in increasingly unpredictable ways. The Canberra wildfire of 2003 created an F2 tornado and black hail. No one could believe the fire was that powerful. In fact, it took seven years of research before a scientific paper was published to uh, confirm that it actually was a tornado that was created by that, the energy from that fire. On May 4th, 2016, the Horse River fire near Fort McMurray in Alberta burned so hot on a blue sky day, there wasn't a cloud anywhere to be seen. It created its own thunderstorm and lightning from that pyro CB ignited a cluster of fires more than 30 kilometers from the fire front. No one had ever seen anything quite like that. In 2015, a slow moving thunderstorm in Alaska shot out 62,000 lightning strikes in five days, triggering 286 fires Fortunately, in areas that were not inhabited by people. No one had ever seen anything like that. And then in August 2017, heat from the BC fire spawned four pyro CB events in just 
five hours. Fire scientists from around the world were in awe. They just could not believe that this rare event, like a pyro CB, could happen four, four times, and actually it was five times because another one uh, erupted simultaneously in Washington states. And since then, we're seeing pyro CBs occur in places where we've never seen them before, Texas, Portugal, South Africa, Argentina, Western Russia. Greenland burned in 2017 and 2019 when I was there. It's all adding up to nightmares for wildfire managers and firefighters. Intense fires, we should be concerned because intense fires are resulting in profound changes to land, rivers, and lakes. Forests yield 40% of the water for the world's 100 largest cities. Now think about what a fire does to, an intense fire does to an aquatic, freshwater aquatic system. This is Cameron Falls in Waterton National Park before the Kenow fire burned in 2017. That was a huge, huge fire that burned about 60%, I think, of all the vegetated area in the park. It's crystal clear. It's a great tourist attraction. Well, a year later, there was a big thunderstorm that collected all the carbon from that fire, and the falls flowed black that year. Or, or the, for, for several days after, afterwards. And this has a really big impact on our drinking water supplies. Uh, Fort McMurray is now spending, I, it says here double, but now almost triple dealing with all that carbon that is flowing downstream into their water treatment plant. Infrastructure is vulnerable. Think about it, 100 million acres of forest and grassland in Canada come into contact with power and telecommunication, telecommunication lines, as well as roads, bridges, and railroads. And these utilities and these roads are getting in harm's way. Hydro-Quebec saw that in 2002, the Henvey Wind Project in Georgian Bay in 2008, Ontario Hydro, Little Grand Rapids in 2018. And the one that really scared everybody was the PG&E uh, uh, event in California, which essentially led to the bankruptcy of the company. Intense fires are liberating potentially deadly toxins from trees and forests, and it's resulting more evacuations than states of emergency. You look at just what happened here in Canada since Slave Lake was evacuated in 2011. We've had Fort McMurray, then we had the 2017 fire season where 65,000 people were evacuated. We've had California, which was at that time the worst fire season ever until 2018 and 2019 came along. So how do we deal with these emerging challenges? Well, we could you know, invest more in fire suppression. We're spending five times more now than we spent in the 1970s. Uh, we could do what the Australians and the Americans are doing in some places, uh, allowing people to stay and defend their homes. Uh, but when people talk about that, I show them this slides of uh, what happened at Pagami Creek uh, in Minnesota in 2011 in the Minnesota Boundary Waters area. It was evacuated at the last min when a, a big windstorm came in and uh, sent a fire uh, towards camp spots. No time for campers and canoes to bring all of their belongings. And this is what happened. The canoes literally melted into the hillside. Uh, so think about that. Think of somebody, a senior who is uh, say uh, 65 years older living on an acreage. Do, they, do we really want them to stay and defend? We need better early warning systems. Uh, I can tell you, I did some follow-up and you read it, probably read it in the book in Fort McMurray where the RCMP uh, decided at some point that this fire may come to town. And so they created their own task force and were working around the clock to try to determine what they could do because no one had ever dealt with a situation like that. And uh, they thought they had everything in hand when uh, the superintendent suddenly got a uh, a cell phone text message with a picture from her sister-in-law and it was a picture of a house burning down. She asked her, well, where's, where's, where, where is that? And she said, it's across the street. And then her colleague, her second command, got a similar one in another part of town. And that was the first that they had heard that the fire had entered Fort McMurray. And when they went to their window to look out, they saw a stream of buses and trucks lined up at a very quiet time of day of people getting out. Uh, we need to draw lines in the sand. 
Fort McMurray, that fire was only eight kilometers from town. And we know from, from what happened in Keenow is that that fire uh, moved 26 kilometers in eight hours. Uh, better public education and preparedness, better building codes and landscape codes or guidelines, infrastructure protection systems, fire smarting homes and properties, more fire breaks, more controlled burning as the indigenous people uh, had done in the past. Allowing lightning triggered fires to burn in remote areas, uh, not a bad idea, but the problem is we just have too many people in harm's way, especially here in, in Alberta where you have so much industrial activity on the landscape. I think probably the most important thing we can do is invest more in science. Think about this, Canadian Forest Service used to have one of the best wildfire science programs in the world. In the 1970s, it employed 2,400 people. Less than 700 work there today, only 100 to 110 are research scientists, and only about a dozen of those are working on wildfire science. So we really need to invest more in that. Do we have time? Well, you know, there's projected doubling or tripling of, of, of fire activity in North America this century. If that happens, how's it going to play out? We're gonna see changes in forest structure, water quality may and likely be degraded, fish populations could suffer, old growth forest animals may be impacted, there are gonna be highway closures, visits to national parks could be curtailed, timber, timber harvesting is likely going to be restricted, community and government assets will be threatened, air quality will worsen, worsen threatening public health as we've seen in California and Colorado. Uh, business as usual is not going to be successful. How bad can it get? Well, look what happened in Australia this year when an estimated, the black summer, an estimated billion animals died. Or look at what happened in California where five, I think of the worst fires they've ever had happened in one season. Four million acres burned more than double the state's previous record. Think about it, before 2003, California did not have a wildfire problem. And look what's happening now. And in Colorado, it's having its worst fire season ever, ever. So what does the past tell us about the future? Well, it can happen really bad. This, the Chinchaga fire burned in 1950. It started on the BC Alberta border and moved into Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, it happened at a time when there was no internet, uh, commun newspaper communication was spotty, and it also happened into a remote area. But the fire, the smoke from that fire, uh, it created, it burned for 220 days and torched a forest that was 175 miles long. And it created a pall of smoke that got all the way to New York City and over to Europe. Um, and nobody knew what was going on. There was, here's the, just a sample of newspaper captions. Rumors of war with Russia. Hampered search for USB-50 bomber. Aircraft grounded. Suspected atomic bombs. Cows milked ahead of schedule. Chickens went to roost. Lights put on afternoon ball games. Street lights turned on during the day. There were blackouts and there were run on banks in Denmark. Uh, Imagine when you think the world is going to end, what do you do? You go to the bank and take out your money. Uh, that is just sort of one of those little tidbits of what can happen uh, under almost natural conditions. But now that we have climate warming, we have more and more people living, working and playing in these landscapes, uh, we are going to see a new wildfire paradigm. We've already seen it unfold like nothing that has happened in the past. And I think we still have time to have some, uh, make some decisions. We can have the good fire, you know, the fire prescribed burns that the indigenous people used to light to manage fire, the manageable fire, you know, the fires that don't get out of hand or a lot more ugly fires like we saw in Fort McMurray and like we've ever seen ever since uh, in California, Colorado, Australia and other parts of the world. Thanks. So uh, fascinating tour of wildfires, kind of horrifying as well. Can I ask you, why did you write about wildfires? Oh, well, you know, 
<laughs> I, I'd always wanted to write a book on fire, wildfire since I got a chance to, you know, uh, observe how fire uh, parks handled wildfire fighters uh, 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 dealt with that 2003 fire season. And what I was really struck by was right at the very end, Rob Walker, the Parks Canada fire uh, specialist, said, you know, that this climate change area, I think this is the harbinger of what's to come. And it stuck with me. And I kept uh, promoting the idea to some publishers. You know, they were thinking, no, it was not, uh, it, 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 was, it wasn't really on the radar at that time. And then, um, uh, my publishers at Island Press in Washington, D.C. decided to go ahead with it in 2015. And then when Fort McMurray came along, they said, can you rush this a little bit? <laughs> and uh, so that was really it. I, I really saw this as one of the climate change events that was going to change the world back in 2003. And it was just me thinking, thinking that. But a lot of people, Mike Flanagan, uh, probably Canada's best uh, wildfire scientist, maybe the world, one of the world's best wildfire scientists. Uh, he was writing back about this back in the 1980s. So that was really, really it. I saw a book uh, there long ago, uh, but it really was uh, too early. We had to have some massive evacuations and uh, maybe set a lot of dead people on the landscape and that kind of thing. That's, that's what catches people's attention. So I, as I hinted at the beginning when I was introducing you, um, when you wrote about the Fort McMurray fire and how it happened a handful of years after the Slave Lake fire. So Slave Lake was in 2011 and Fort Mac was in 2016. And yeah. is that right? And so they, the people in Slave Lake were expecting to be asked for about their experience and to come down and help in Fort McMurray. And yet somehow organizationally that didn't happen and they were surprised and they went anyway <laughs> and went and trained people that to me yeah. yeah it's kind of an interesting story and I guess given everything we've seen in 2020 I mean everything we've seen in 2020 and realizing that we weren't really prepared for a pandemic such as the one we find ourselves in do you think that there are parallels between that situation and the wildfire situation or are we better organized have we learned from Fort McMurray and even the, the northern fires in Ontario in 2018, which certainly affected my family. Yeah, uh, that was, that was, that, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, the problem right now isn't our ability to, you know, these our suppression abilities. Uh, we're investing in a lot in that, a lot in that. But there's only so far that can take you is that when you really think about it, Wildfire is a meteorological event like a hurricane that can't be stopped once it gets to a certain size. Uh, and, you know, you can throw out any, but say a, a thousand, two thousand hectare fire driven by strong winds and hot weather. Uh, no amount of water bombers or people on the ground is going to, are going to be able to put that out. Uh, so we've got to start coming up with better tools to provide uh, wildfire fighters on the ground in the air so they can better manage these fires and maybe detect them before they become mega fires. And that's where I think science is, uh, is, is going to pave the way because um, there were, there's some incredible work being done right now about you know, being able to determine where lightning is likely to strike so that you could maybe deploy your people on the ground there uh, uh, quickly in order to put out the fire. Uh, we're just not doing that. I mean, some, you know, there's been a nice investment here by the National Science and Engineering Research uh, Council, uh, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council in Canada. Uh, but I think a lot more has got to be invested. Uh, we've got to get back to the 1970s uh, and uh, reestablish a permanent kind of uh, expertise within the Canadian Forest Service, expand it more into the universities and start working with Indigenous communities, the business community, uh, local governments, so that another Fort McMurray, uh, if it, when, it, and it is when it comes along, mm -hmm. we're better prepared for it. Uh, I don't think we are prepared for it right now. Uh, we're still uh, dealing with fires like we have uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so a lot more needs to be done. Interesting. Yeah, I guess um, I'm always looking for connections between 
these things and other areas of science. So it struck me that these big disasters are happening. Yeah, California is now, they're, they're using supercomputers mm -hmm. to, uh, to try to figure out some of these, uh, these questions. Right. And a lot is being invested in it. And I, I think things, you know, we, there, there are solutions to this. Uh, but, you know, really uh, the, 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 the practice in Canada and the United States and other parts of the world is that we're really, really good at compensating people who are victims of fires, say, and floods. But we're not very good at uh, preventing those things from, or, or investing money in preventing those things from happening. So, you know, you can give uh, $100 million to compensate people in Fort McMurray, which is actually much more than that, but nobody wants to invest five or $10 million in fire science, uh, which it could have actually maybe prevented Fort McMurray from happening. It, it doesn't make any economic sense. Right, that's interesting. Well, we have a question in, uh, wondering if you could define the term you used. I think it's pyro CB or pyro CBS. Yeah, pyro CB is essentially a, uh, a thunderstorm that is created by the energy of a fire. So, and it has, it has as much energy as a volcano. Uh, and most people did not believe this. In fact, there was a, uh, uh, someone I know, know fairly well from the uh, Naval Defense Lab in Washington, D.C., who started noticing... Uh, uh, these aerosols in the atmosphere, really weird ones in the 19 or in the 1990s and early 2000s, and he kept trying to tell his his superiors there's something weird going on in the in the stratosphere, and uh, they said, well, it's a volcano, and then he looked, there was no volcano, and then he started doing some Sherlock Holmes detective work and started seeing that they were they were coincided with these, some of these really big wildfires that were happening in Canada, especially Northern Canada. And it took him several years to convince the scientific community that in fact, there's enough energy in a wildfire to bust through the troposphere and get into the stratosphere and travel around the world. And of course, there's no rain uh, in the stratosphere. And so it just lingers there for, for, for months. And, you know, there's even theories now is that we could actually, if we have enough fires, enough of these pyro CB events in the future, I mean, this is very futuristic, but people are thinking about it. Uh, we could actually have kind of short-term cooling episodes like we did when Man Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1992 and dropped temperatures, you know, by a degree or two for the next year in many parts of the world. Remember it very well. Um, just in case you're, you're viewing and wondering how these questions are coming through to us, put them in the comments section on YouTube. You can email them to information at rciscience.ca or tweet to at rciscience or at the museum and we'll pick them up there. We have another one here. Uh, you've talked about risk mitigation and transferring risk. Do you think there'll be a time when we talk about risk acceptance and when we plan for fires to burn through communities? I think that we have to some extent, and I think that is uh, uh, folly uh, because we, trying to estimate the level of risk of a something that we uh, have no idea how risky it can be. And I, I just you know, point to what's happened in the last four years. We thought Fort McMurray was, was the seminal event, you know, the, uh, a 100, one, 150 you know, year uh, episode. And what we've seen in the last four years is that we've really underestimated the risk of wildfire. So I think it would be very dangerous to start accepting risk. And I think what we need to do is start uh, preparing ourselves. And there are a number of way, ways you can do it. You know, like as I pointed out by fire smarting your homes if you're living in a, a forested area. I, for example, live here in Edmonton in the, river, uh, in the River Valley. I have a wood house. I have, what, four, five, six, 110-year-old uh, spruce trees at the front of my house. I have ornamental cedars all around it. And I have a forest just within 100 
meters of where I live along the river valley. So if a fire gets, you know, say lightning strikes in the middle of the night or right right now, we have a lot of homeless people living in the forest river valley and say they're lighting a fire and it gets out of control. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm vulnerable and I have to start thinking about this. And I think that this is what everybody has to start thinking is, is it, how is it going to affect us down the road? And there are a number of ways that we can deal with this, I think. Um, at various level, at a federal, provincial, municipal level, and in a community level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, I lived in California and people were always counseled to cut back the eucalyptus trees that were near their homes because they just were a very uh, dangerous tree to have near your house. But I mean, you know, that's only so much that you can do. So it needs a bigger uh, plan as well. And I'm kind of curious reading your book, um, are you seeing an increase I mean, we talk about investing in science or so research behind how wildfires and forest fires work and spread and how they behave in particular, and that that has diminished from its heyday of this in the 70s. But are you seeing any increase back towards evidence based uh, approach to living with fire? I mean, I say firefighting, but really, as the last question came through, I mean, we, we really do have to live with these things. So are you seeing people accepting that we need to actually increase um, funding for research? In yeah, uh, you know, I think the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council recently enlisted, I think it's in the range of $5 million in research, okay. which, is a, which is a good start, but I think a lot more needs to be done. Uh, but it's promising. Uh, at least it's on the radar now, uh, you know, with a venerable uh, uh, funding agency like that. Um, and so, but when you look at what's really happening in places like Australia, California, Colorado, what happened in BC, what's happened in Fort McMurray in Northern Ontario, Ontario in 2018, Georgian Bay in 2018, yeah. <laughs> uh, you start realizing that uh, this is a bigger issue than it was just five years ago. That, and it is one that is becoming increasingly complicated and uh, head spinning in a way, you know, this is the, the, uh, a term that I hear from fire scientists all the time is that it's just a head spinning event that, you know, we just didn't, you know, they, you kind of imagine that some of these intense events could happen, but the rapidity with which they're happening has really just, uh, really raised a lot of eye eyebrows. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's exciting. Uh, I know and depressing at the same time to be a fire science because it's a it, it's a huge challenge. Oh, well, very definitely. I um, have experienced it remotely from having lived in California and seeing what's happened there in the last few years. And this year, sitting watching a fire encroaching on the Mount Wilson Observatory and spending the evening yeah. watching that and hoping my beloved place wasn't going to burn down. <laughs> it's, it's been very stressful, but it is it is interesting. Um, when I was reading your book something that struck me that hadn't occurred to me, and I'm not sure why it didn't occur to me, but that the protection of timber, timber was a big resource in Canada for sure. So protecting that resource, was that a large part of the decision to control fires and suppress them rather than to do prescribed burns? Was that part of the decision making there? And I yeah, I mean, right, you know, with the people at the U.S. Forest Service and even Bernard Furnow at the uh, University of Toronto referred to uh, forests as crops that needed to be harvested and that fire was evil. It was a menace and we had to ex had, had to remove it from the landscape. Uh, if th their goal was to basically put out every fire by 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, the following day of detection. And so that was the, that was a big part of it. Uh, but there was other things uh, also at play, uh, you know, with Teddy Roosevelt, who uh, uh, was the U.S. president uh, during the 1900s. Uh, he, his chief scientist, Gifford Pinchot, was uh, uh, a forester. Um, he was a big opponent of the clear cutting that was going on, and he uh, really saw fire management as a conservation tool. So there was a number of things that came into play. Um, the problem, problem was that we became too good at it, too overzealous, and we started investing in just uh, trying to create. You know, every time I, I keep telling anybody who comes to visit and I take them through the Icefield Parkway 
from Jasper to Banff, which is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but you know, you point out is that that wasn't there 110 years ago. I mean, that's basically a, a you know, you have, you have a 80 to 100 year old stands uniformly from one end to the other. And that's not the way mother nature would have done it in the days before Europeans arrived on the scene. Lightning would have created a much different landscape. And also uh, you mentioned in the book how in the creation of the national parks of Banff and Jasper that a lot of indigenous people were relocated or basically told they couldn't continue to do what they had done for thousands of years, which is some controlled burns or prescribed burns, presumably for hunting purposes, but also to create sort of savanna-like uh, areas to graze cattle? Would be, uh, would, would have been, uh, in the prairies, it would have been to create gra grasslands oh, yeah. um, for bison. And so they would have also started fires to herd bison mm -hmm. uh, into essentially killing lanes. Uh, there was also, they, they used it to clear out forested areas so to promote the growth of berries and a number of different uh, boreal plants such as Labrador tea which was saw seen as a medicine uh, as a form of medicine mm -hmm. there's a whole long list of them uh, and so they were really very fine managers uh, and we just didn't appreciate this there's some really kind of sad stories uh, wasn't the only re fire wasn't the only reason why we kicked them out um, as anybody who knows the history of uh, our relationship with Indigenous people, there were a lot more reasons than that. But one of the saddest stories, I think, comes out of Riding, I think it's Riding Mountain National Park, where uh, they were kicking people out of that park when it was created, the Indigenous people. And as they were leaving with all their belongings, they saw smoke in the background, and it was the uh, park wardens were burning down all of their houses so that they wouldn't return. That's a, that's a very, well, it's part of a very dark history. But it is. You told me earlier that in fact, there is a, a development now in the recognition that prescribed burning and controlled burning is a good thing to prevent these massive wildfires. And that because indigenous people are, uh, have a history and knowledge uh, of how to do it properly, that you mentioned in Kelowna, the Kelowna First Nations is actually doing some very good work in that area. I think that would be an interesting thing to hear more about. Yeah, they're, uh, you know, they're one of a number who are, are, you know, working with scientists from the University of British Columbia uh, to try to figure out how they can um, return their landscape to what it was be more naturally. And they're doing a lot of prescribed burning and thinning and, uh, and, and, and also uh, selling the merchantable timber uh, as a resource. In uh, the Yukon, you have one of the First Nations there that are fire smarting their community, selling some of the commercial, the merchantable timber, but also instead of just uh, burning the, uh, the non-commercial timber, they're using it to uh, uh, power their boilers in the community centers and the offices, rather than de using diesel that might be brought in from British Columbia by truck. Uh, so I think that one of the interesting things is we're starting seeing now uh, a return to this uh, mastery of uh, forest management that Indigenous people uh, were forced to stop doing. And it's, I think it's becoming very promising. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it as we continue this reconciliation in Canada with First Nations people. It's one of the good news stories, I think. I was just going to say, it's nice to have a good news story to talk about. Now, we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, somebody writes, as a society, we really love living near water in wildlands, mountains, forests. And, but these places are also often where disasters are more prevalent. Uh, should we be building these places back once they're destroyed? Or should we acknowledge that there are some places we shouldn't put human settlements in? And is it realistic to expect that they, we won't develop in certain areas again? And this obviously uh, goes beyond fire. I mean, look at the it, it's, it's It's a great question. Um, yeah. And um, I guess the, the best way of answering it now is uh, what I, I was speaking to the Canadian Council of Forest uh, uh, Ministers, uh, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before. Uh, one of the Liberal cabinet ministers was uh, um, uh, in the prairies uh, handing out checks to get people uh, to move out of floodplains because they were... Yeah. And so it's a good question. Do we start considering that um, 
uh, as a possibility. I don't know that we have to really go that far. I think that what we knew, need to do in places like Jan Jasper and Banff, and we're seeing it being done to some extent, uh, is uh, making those communities more resilient to, to fire. Uh, I don't know that we can completely, and this, this risk management thing, question comes back in, into play. Uh, but then there's all sorts of other questions uh, that come in is that do you expropriate land and kick people off uh, or do you just encourage them to these communities to make them more resilient. The problem right now with that is that most of these communities are small. They have a very small tax base. Many of them are First Nations community. Think about uh, First Nations represent 4% of the Canadian population, but 40% of the evacuations uh, in Canada. Uh, what we need to do is provide these communities with an expertise, say a full-time person who has the resources and the knowledge to provide them with the plan. How do we make our community more resilient to fire? Uh, how can we manage fire better and give them, then give them the resources that are, are required? You know, we give subsidies to oil and gas companies and other industry, uh, and we give people, let, let, let's even, let, let, let's not make it that political. Let's, let's look at the subsidies we give people to get away from uh, fossil fuel burning cars and buy, to buy electric cars. Why can't we make that similar investment in boreal forest communities and encourage people to start building houses that are more fire resilient, making the community more resilient to fire? We're just not doing that. And I think that we've, we're, we're, we're impoverishing uh, the most vulnerable uh, and, and, and putting them at greater risk. Another thing with a parallel to the present day, I think, um, we have another question, and this is one that I think can extend beyond fire into many issues. How do we get the attention of decision makers long enough to sustain the program level approach that is needed? Political interest usually three years post fire, says this questioner. So is there, is there a way to engage with our politicians and decision makers to try and get them to see that this is a longer term project than the next dare I say, poll or election? Well, number, I guess the first thing is you vote. The second thing is become a little more politically active to start challenging uh, politicians and forcing them to consider it. Uh, I talk about this all the time with people in the wildfire community and they're demoralized because they think that they're not, politicians aren't going to take this seriously until we have a lot of dead people on the landscape, like a fire where, you know, at Fort McMurray, there was estimates when that fire was coming through that they may, might have 1,500 to 3,000 people dead. And they were trying to figure out, well, where do we put the morgue? We don't have body bags. What, they, they were totally unprepared for it. Um, and it could have happened. It was just that there was so many things that uh, favored, uh, that prevented that disaster. And you think about it, Fort McMurray, nobody goes to Fort McMurray to retire. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a lot of old people who are not mobile. Fort McMurray, you have oil and gas workers who are trained in safety. And the first business of safety is listen to what the person in charge is telling you. So there's not chaos. There was a or fairly orderly evacuation. The third thing that happened was that they had, they were just were about to open the twin highway so that twice as many people could get out uh, to go south. And the fourth thing that happened was that essentially mother nature just came in and blew the fire away from town uh, at the very last minute. And so uh, there could have been a lot, a lot more buildings burned down. We're, at some point, we're going to have a fire in Canada where we're not going to be that lucky. And I fear that it's going to be in some retirement community like Salt Spring Island, um, you know, which is forested from one end to the other and no easy way of getting off the island. Um, I think that we've, you know, this is things that we've got to start considering right across the country. Mm -hmm. I, I read in the book, um, a place I've been to many times, the top of Sulphur Mountain in Banff National Park, and what would happen if there was a fire encroaching on the visitor center at the top. And I thought, I don't know if I'll ever go back up there again. It's a lovely spot, but I mean, it's, I had never considered that. I always was worried about bears, not about fires, but I guess 
Yeah, I know that, 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 that's sort of the, you know, the, it's a cultural thing is that uh, we grow up, uh, you know, fearing bears and increasingly now mountain lions mm -hmm. and fire's never really been part of the picture, but more and more now it's becoming one of the biggest threats to uh, backcountry hikers and even people possibly in the town sites. So, mm -hmm. uh, you look at places like Jasper, there's only one road in and one road out. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, it's heavily forested there. Are, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of the, the, the recent Dave Smith, the recently retired, uh, uh, fire wildfire specialist in Jasper before he retired, he told me that by the, when summer came along, it was, a, he had nightmares fearing that there was a big fire going to come in from the BC side and into an area where they really would have a very difficult time getting a foothold to stop the fire from coming into town. Um, you know, it weighs on, yeah, I, I, I really admire these, these wildfire specialists because they are faced with a, a challenge now that's increasing and they really do not have all the tools they, they need to be able to, to get control of it or manage it. It's, it's amazing to watch them. And um, I guess I just wanted to finish because we've talked a little bit. I don't know if there's any more questions. If there are, get them in now. Um, first off, I have to say parachuting beavers into the back country. That was brilliant. I mean, did they actually do it? I have to know. They, they did. Wisconsin did it. Uh, <laughs> I think it was, I, I can't remember. It was several dozen beavers. Um, and uh, it, it's funny because when I, when I, 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 I was invited to speak at the wildfire summer, which was the governor of California uh, uh, staged in 2018 or 19 in Sacramento. And I told this story and there were people from the California government said, you know, we're actually thinking of doing that, not parachuting them, but <laughs> using beavers uh, to create wetlands in, in the Sierra Nevadas yeah. and places like that that are drying out rapidly. And I actually think it's not a bad idea because when you think about it, that's the other thing that we've done to, you know, I think it was Margaret Atwood uh, said that we're a country uh, that made us living on dead beavers and, you know, the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company. And so we removed so many of those wetland engineers from our landscape. Um, and I think that, you know, there is, a, there is a potential here to reintroduce beavers in areas, you know, forested areas that are extremely vulnerable to fire and say recreate peatlands that, uh, that have dried out. Uh, so I, th I, I, it's not such a crazy idea. I, it, it just the visuals and I just was flabbergasted that that's really a fun thing. Um, I guess on the nickel. Uh, uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I guess in light of what everything we're all thinking about right now, I imagine, is you talked about international cooperation and it's something that has struck me uh, watching fires. Uh, I have family in Australia as well. So, I mean, they're just everywhere and how we do cooperate and swap expertise there. Um, and I'm just curious, given that the, we're all watching the results of the U S election and how there is fairly close co cooperation in the fire fighting efforts between the two countries. Um, has that, I'm just curious how that's all faring in this current political climate. Have you noticed, and are you willing to comment on, I mean, well, this, was a, that are, uh, yeah, this just, was a problem because of COVID, um, okay, yeah. and, and sharing of international resources became a real problem. So right. we didn't send many people on the ground. We sent a lot of, uh, water bombers, mm -hmm. um, uh, to California and I think possibly to, to Colorado. I'm not sure about that. Right. Um, but I think the good news is that it, so, you know, it's a fraternity of men and women uh, at the highest level and right down to the bottom. Um, and they work, I think, fairly independently and they have a, a system in place to share resources and I have a hard time seeing that any politician, even Donald Trump is going to, should he win, you know, focus on that one thing. It's just, it's mm -hmm. small potatoes. Um, you know, it doesn't cost a lot of money, um, but who knows? But I, I think it's something that is really important, but it's also something that I think that it would be folly to, to rely on it too much because you have different 
different firefighting strategies and techniques and expectations. Uh, you know, we had the South Africans come to help to put out the Fort McMurray fire and they essentially went on strike when they heard that people, were get, others were getting paid more than they were. Uh, in 2003, with the Parks Canada fires in Banff and Jasper, Kootenai, uh, there was a bit of a problem because they were bringing in people from the East Coast who really didn't have a lot of experience dealing with mountain fires. A mountain fire is much different than a flat uh, prairie or boreal fire. They, they behave in very much different ways. And so the managers of those fires were always nervous about uh, you know, people not really attuned to these conditions uh, becoming, getting in harm's way. So that's why I think that we've got to get away from investing so much into fire suppression and mm -hmm. getting more in fire science, give us better tools to deal with fire so that we don't have to put so many people on the ground and in the air. And at risk, yeah. Um, yeah. Sounds to me like that's a good place to wrap up our discussion. Um, I guess, you know, if you were to give one piece of advice um, about fires, it's that we should be investing in learning more about them, right? I think so, yeah. I, I really think that science is our, our, our best opportunity, investing in science is our best opportunity of providing uh, wildfire uh, managers and firefighters on the ground in the air with the, the, the tools that they need to uh, deal with this new paradigm that's unfolding. Um, it's, it, it really is, I, I think, imperative that we move in that direction. Right. Well, it's fascinating. Uh, for those of you who haven't read it, Firestorm is the book and uh, new books coming out. But there are some other books also. Ed Struzik's books are all available at your local favorite bookstore or your local Evil Empire online bookstore. Um, they're well worth a read. Uh, I've really enjoyed Firestorm. As I said, I have a several personal connections to these fires. And I find it that it's interesting how when you write about them, they almost develop personalities and definitely the people that you write about. So these stories about the fires are written through the eyes of the people who really experience them. And I found that very uh, affecting and they are really interesting people as well. So there's some really interesting characters involved and I really appreciated that. Um, I'd just like to close out by saying that Ed was our 1994 Fleming Medal recipient, and uh, we will be awarding our 2020 Fleming Medal uh, to another Albertan, uh, Professor Timothy Caulfield, who is um, at the University of Alberta. We're going to be doing that on the 24th of November, so if any of you are interested in learning a little more about what he does for science communication, which is primarily in the field of health, uh, please tune in. It'll be at 7 p.m. on the 24th. But other than that, uh, there are no more questions coming in. I would like to thank very much the museum and Claire and Daniel working the AV behind the scenes and my colleague, Carrie, for helping put on this wonderful evening tonight. And especially to you, Ed, thank you very much. I hope uh, that we get to work again. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank I you. Enjoyed it.